Nate, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Stefan. Thanks for inviting me. So, Nate, uh, we've been chatting for a while, and I know you obviously have some expertise and some practice now in running lightning nodes. And this is something, um, you know, we've even been chatting in the background about it for a little while. And I thought it would be great to get an episode to get your thoughts on it. And of course, I know you're working at Voltage as well. So you can probably share a little bit from that side also. Um, so yeah, do you want to just give us, give a little bit of a background on yourself for the SLP listeners so they know who you are and what's your involvement in this whole Bitcoin and lightning world? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so my name's Nate. Uh, I go by Beef or Bacon One on Twitter, and I am a Bitcoiner. Been a Bitcoiner for a while, and in the sort of bear market of 2018, I was thinking about running a node for the first time. And near the edge of 2019, there I came across the Staticus Raspi Bolt. Uh, guide on building your own node on a uh, Raspberry Pi. And I decided to dive into that with zero Linux experience whatsoever and managed to figure it out. And I honestly just wanted to run a Bitcoin node at the time, but I saw Lightning as sort of like a bonus, like, cool, I get to run a Bitcoin node and a Lightning node at the same time. And then after that, I just sort of went deep into Lightning and started learning about channels and liquidity. I spent a lot of time on the LND Slack. Obviously, I was running LND at that time. And eventually, I, I noticed the community in 2020 and 2021 was really starting to grow out. People are starting to talk about it more. So I got into just helping as many people as I could. Uh, at the time, I was still working my sort of normal non-Bitcoin job, but and raising a family and everything. But, you know, when I could spare time, I was working with the PlebNet guys or running um, free Calendly uh, consulting to help people, you know, at, answer general questions about running Lightning. And then uh, Voltage hired me last September to sort of spearhead the support and education part of the service, which I've been doing. And, uh, and it's been great. So that's, I guess, that's the uh, general overview there. Fantastic. And so... I think it's probably important for listeners, maybe if you're new or maybe you're not as advanced into this, just to understand the different Lightning users. So let's say as an example, mm. there are some different types and maybe you want to spell out some of your thoughts. I mean, let me just open with a few ideas and you can expand on that. So as an idea, you might be, let's say, just a retail user of Lightning. And so this might be a person who is using different Lightning services like Phoenix, Breeze, Moon, uh, or even Wallet of Satoshi, you're using Lightning services and you're typically just making small payments and receiving. Another user type might be the routing node operator. And so mm -hmm. this is a person who's trying to set up and actually you know, set up channels and these are distinct roles, right? And then you might, another example might be a person who is a merchant. So you are receiving typically payments. And so you need to set up, you might need to set up a Lightning node from that point of view. And then maybe another bucket or category might be like a lightning service provider and some of these might be like a routing node but they are kind of doing a slightly different service themselves mm -hmm. right and then so there's kind of this ecosystem of different user types right because maybe if people are looking back to let's say 2018 or 2019 it's just kind of like oh it, just, it was all the one thing right like one person was just doing everything but now it's almost like we're seeing a distinction in the different role types so do you want to just expand a little bit on that just for those people who are new to lightning maybe they're learning about bitcoin and lightning yeah i i think that maybe some people when they're starting to hear about lightning and nodes they start thinking about everybody needs to run it the same way or have the same goal uh but that's that's not the case at all uh you a, a routing trying to trying to build out a routing node takes takes time energy and and uh effort right but if you are trying to be a Bitcoin, Sovereign, you know, there's a lot of Lightning wallets out there that are very user friendly, but you're trusting third parties and, and whatnot. But if you just want to, you know, buy gift cards on BitRefill or pay with Moon and you want to run your own node and you just want to do that, that, that is probably the easiest way to go about it. Because after you get your node running, you simply open up channels to other to routing nodes and we can go over how to choose who to open up channels with later. And essentially, you're good to go. You have your outbound capacity, and now you can make payments. Great, and you're you're all set. Um, 
Merchants are a little bit different because you're more inbound focused as a merchant, meaning you, the liquidity that you want needs to be, um, you know, receivable. Uh, so that's called your remote or your inbound capacity. So that's the equivalent of somebody opening up a channel to your node. And that's where a lot of node uh, liquidity services have kind of popped up, such as, um, well, you've got the marketplaces from Lightning Labs, the Lightning Pool, uh, C Lightning, now known as Core Lightning, has liquidity ads. So essentially, if you're running a routing node and you have excess liquidity, you can basically sell that liquidity to new node runners at, or merchants specifically uh, need that. And I think that is a really cool concept that is continuing to hopefully be made easier and eventually I think will be obfuscated away for merchants that want to run a node. They could simply say, hey, I want liquidity, boom, bam, and they get some. So I, I'm hoping that's the future. I think it's going that way. And then, of course, is the routing node operator, which is someone that has a lot of capital. And by what I mean a lot, I mean like, so now we're getting into the part where this is my opinion. Uh, a lot, I would say to start a routing node, you probably need, I don't know, again, this is just my opinion, but I think 5 million sad channels are probably the sweet spot. And I think around 20 channels are probably uh, pretty good. And not all of those channels have to be channels that you open uh, yourself. It could be channels you receive from others. And, and that's the most complex. So we could get into that, but that's probably the most complex. Um, a lot of people, though, I think start lightning nodes out of curiosity, meaning they don't want to do any of that. They just want to learn how it works. And then they maybe transition to that in the future. Maybe they decide, okay, this was like my beginner node. I learned a lot doing it. I'm going to shut it all down. And I'm going to make a new one, maybe on better hardware or something, and then take it seriously from there. So I work with a lot of those kind of people also. So Fantastic. yeah, that's a general and, overview. Yeah, that's great. And I think that is a great segue into... That next question I had, which is around what kinds of lightning nodes we can run, because obviously we can run a Raspberry Blitz or an Umbral or a MyNode or you know various other uh, node packages. And typically people might start out as like a beginner or learning node. They might start out with a Raspberry Pi or one of these single board computer type small computers. And that's been a bit of a discussion in the community like my friend Katan is uh, quite against the whole Raspberry Pi he believes you should run a box and then mm -hmm. there's another camp which is you can run a VPS and obviously Voltage uh, can help you with mm -hmm. that so do you want to just spell out some of your thoughts comparing some of those three right so uh, the Raspberry Pi or let's say a Rock Pro 64 versus the second option which is like running a box at your home like your own box or thirdly running a VPS if you could just explain a little bit about each of those and your thoughts on those okay. for a lightning node runner. Yeah. So raspberry Pis are obviously very popular, very affordable in a lot of ways and fairly powerful for what you, you get with them. And I think running just like a normal Bitcoin node, you know, base layer Bitcoin node on a raspberry Pi is great because it's, you can turn it off whenever you want and it's not as intensive uh, when you start using it with Lightning, though, um, all of a sudden you're dealing with, um, so with Lightning, you need to be online all the time, right? And I'm not saying Raspberry Pis are going to break down or anything. I mean, they've been known to do that, but being online is a big issue, um, especially if you want to run a quality routing node, because that's going to affect your overall network uh, reputation. Um, but you're going to want to... Um, Eventually, consider that the Lightning Network is a gossip-based protocol, which means package it, packets and stuff, of, uh, informa you're sending information out to the network constantly and receiving information from the network constantly. Um, as you get more and more channels and build out your node, this might prove to be a bottleneck in the future. So I, I, I really think that if you're running a routing node, which in my opinion is more than 20 channels, uh, I think the next step is to get a mini computer. So what I did after I decided to take it seriously was I went to Google and I was like, I want to build a budget mini gaming PC, right? And there, it's really cool because if you Google something like that, it'll be like, it'll, it'll show you the parts you need to buy. And building a computer is actually pretty straightforward these days. So a mini ITX, that, that, that's basically the size of the motherboard which is just this little maybe eight inch by eight inch board. 
in a little case and you just put the pieces together and you got a pretty powerful machine for $500 basically. Uh, you might spend a little bit more than that on the hard drive if you want to go to like a two terabyte or something and really do that. But I, I would I would say that's the next step for the home lightning enthusiast. And now we get to like VPS stuff, which is been around for a while. And um, generally with VPS, you are essentially renting computer power from a data center somewhere and you are manually installing, configuring, doing all this stuff, very technical, uh, you know, uh, command line type stuff usually. And that is pretty good for those that are traveling a lot, don't want to deal with power outages. Um, Obviously, you could connect into your node remotely with mobile apps like Zeus. So a lot of folks like to do that when on the go. And then Voltage comes along and is like, we've developed a way to provision you, your own node, that we don't see what's happening whatsoever. We don't know what you're doing. We have no access to your funds. And everything's encrypted client side with your node unlock password, basically. So even if we wanted to see what you were doing, we can't do anything. The worst that we, when I say we, the worst that Voltage could do is um, basically remove access to your Voltage dashboard per se, but that doesn't mean you lose your money. That doesn't mean that we take your money. It just means that you, if that worst case happened, you'd have to recover just as if your hardware broke down or something, Uh, which is a really interesting solution. And uh, I, I find that, uh, so far, a lot of folks that are wanting to sell things on Shopify or even BTC Pay Server, which Voltage does have natively integrated into the platform, uh, really like that they don't need to deal with updates, upgrades, uptime, and that sort of um, hands-on requirement of running a physical node at home. So we're building that out and, and working on some other things too. So. To boil it all down, I think that it's just there's so many user types, right? So maybe, for example, you could run your routing node at home because you have physical access to that. You know the configurations and everything. But then maybe you're a node, you can run a second node that you just buy things with, right? That could be your voltage node, for example, uh, which you can run on Neutrino, which is very... Uh, which is a little bit more affordable than a standard node uh, for the Voltage platform and connect to it with Zeus and boom, you're all, you're all set. You open up a couple of big channels to like async or something or bit refill if you're using gift cards a lot and, and off you go and you don't have to worry about your routing node um, touching any of that. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. So, so let me summarize a little bit. So if you are just looking to be a very basic user and you just want to be able to spend and receive and you're not that concerned about sort of the privacy self-sovereignty i mean you can just literally use one of those phone wallet apps right like the phoenix Mm -hmm. you know moon breeze some of these others and then let's say when you're at the level of let's say learning about lightning network nodes and you want to run one just to learn that's where let's say the raspberry blitz and umbral and things like that you can do that and of course i mean there are users who do use their Raspberry Blitz as their routing node. So you can absolutely mm-hmm. do that. Uh, and then let's say you want to take it the next level up. That's where you have like the box at your home, as you spelled out. You, you, you're you using a, a mini tower approach. And I guess the main trade-offs and balances there are that you might be able to run with more beefy hardware. And therefore, because of the gossip network, because of, let's say, everyone's uh, having to run this channels database and all this other stuff that's going in and out of that having a more beefy box can help you with that and then obviously the the vps option is great for people who are wanting to run a very like a larger an even larger node and they're maybe slightly less concerned about the self-sovereignty part of it but they want more the availability maybe they want to be able to travel and maybe they want some of that the ease aspect of it because the vps the provider vps virtual private server is running some of that in the background for you. And let's say the professional uh, cloud infrastructure is being done in a way where they ensure very high uptime, very high availability, some of these professional level concerns. So that's probably uh, the 
you know, just a, a basic overview of the different options mm-hmm. that you can go with there. Now, also curious from a Lightning implementation point of view, because there are different Im- Im- implementations, right? So obviously, LND from Lightning Labs is one of the big ones. Core Lightning now, it used to be called C Lightning by Blockstream. We've got uh, Rust Lightning and let's call it Sensei by, you know, uh, mm-hmm. which is utilizing that. We have the Electrum Lightning implementation, and there's also the Async implementation. Those are probably the well-known ones. There might be one or two other smaller ones. Do you have any thoughts uh, on the different Lightning implementations? Do you have any that you prefer using? For sure, yeah. So I guess we just need to define what a node is really quick. So a node is just software running on your computer, right? Or somewhere. And that node software has the ability to interact with other node software. So like when we say these implementations, they all operate under at least the first 11 bolts, which is the basis of lightning technology is sort of a rule set for interoperability between all the implementations. Uh, There's some debate about bolt 12, but we can talk about that another time, but at least the first 11 bolts are pretty much agreed on. So uh, if I'm running a LND node made by lightning labs and you're running a core or core lightning node made by, Blockstream, we can still open up channels with each other and do things, you know, no problem. Um, there are different features, though, um, that are on top of that sort of base interoperability that each implementation might have. For example, Lightning Labs has the loop service and the pool service. Core Lightning has um, liquidity ads and a few other things. So uh, LND is definitely more consumer grade, I would say, meaning the ease of use and the build out of it is very, they're focusing a lot on user experience. For example, they have a lightning terminal uh, app that lets you easily uh, in a graphical user interface, interact with their pool and lightning, I'm sorry, their pool and loop um, services and stuff where uh, Blockstream's core lightning is more focused on uh, features and and maybe more of an enterprise grade setup. Uh, there are some third party apps that uh, provide a user interface for core lightning. Uh, Ride the lightning is one of them. And then we're getting into so like Eclair. Funny enough, uh, so Eclair is the implementation built by Async. They've been around since the beginning. As a matter of fact, the very first time I used Lightning was on the Eclair wallet, which was pretty fun for the time. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think that um, they're really focused on the, the mobile um, set, set up a little bit. Like Phoenix is their sort of next gen wallet that's been out for a while, mobile wallet that um, I highly recommend people try out. I think it's really great. And now we have the LDK, uh, the Lightning Development Kit, uh, which is um, basically put together by Spiral, which is a sort of development team funded by Blocks. Block, now? which used Block. to be called Square. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And so the LDK is kind of cool because now if you are a developer or a development team and you have um, sort of a really cool idea, you can essentially use these libraries in this development kit to piece together the, 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 the foundation of your own implementation. And then you can build whatever cool stuff you want on top of that. Sensei is a really good example of that. John Cantrell, which you had on recently talked about uh, Sensei, which uh, I'm really excited about. I'm really excited about other LDK sort of ideas. Uh, I think the child node concept is very, very interesting and I'm excited to, uh, to see where that further goes. So there's those are definitely the the major implementations right now. And I if if a lot of people say, gosh, well, geez, if if Lightning Labs and Blockstream have like a stranglehold on this uh, for a long time, you know, what does that mean? And I really see them someday, I mean, this might not be true, but some someday I think that there'll be a lot of implementations, all for specific use cases. There might be like a merchant focused implementation someday that has really cool merchant accounting features or um, or a, a gaming implementation for those that someday in the future are building video games that have something to do with sats and lightning. 
so I, I'm excited to see that sort of ecosystem build out in the coming years. Gotcha. And so from your perspective, when you're coaching and helping educate, what are some of the what are some of the typical implementations you've been working with? Has it typically been helping people with their LND or with their C lightning uh, or core lightning rather? Yeah, it's definitely been LND probably near 100% of the time. Um, I've, I've still have very little experience with C lightning or core lightning, uh, uh, even though my good friend Lisa over at Blockstream is constantly trying to get me to run one. I just haven't had the time yet. Um, they're coming out with a, a version update here soon that they're getting excited about. Uh, 0.11 is coming out soon. They're already at like the third release candidate. So the, the final version should be out any any day now. So I might have to. The, the problem is too is Raspberry Raspberry Pirates are really hard to find now. <laughs> so I'm trying to um, figure out a way to uh, to get a Sea Lightning going uh, soon. Um, I have not run any other Node implementations though. I I have run Sensei on RegTest for fun. I don't think that really counts though because it's not quite you know there yet. Uh, but definitely LND ninety nine point nine percent of the time. Gotcha. And so let's talk a little bit about setting up your own Lightning node and some of the getting started points there. So let's say you're setting up your Lightning node. What are some of the things you should be doing at the start? Uh, maybe uh, in terms of yeah. channel opening as well. Like how do you pick who you open channels with? Yeah, this is this is a great question. And I'm, I'm assuming that... Um, Maybe we want to eventually have a routing node, you know, but we want to kind of like learn a little bit first. The, the first thing that you're going to want to do is decide how much capital you want to allocate to your node at the beginning. Uh, you want to say, hey, I want to open up 10 million sats worth of channels or 20 million sats worth of channels. You, you want to have these numbers in your head. You don't want to just like open up willy nilly because that will um, help you decide what size channels to open with once once you get going. So, for example... If I wanted to put a whole Bitcoin into bootstrapping a new routing node, uh, I would probably say, okay, I probably want 15 to 20 channels of like five to 7 million sets each and just have a nice little divisibility on that. Um, the hardest part about bootstrapping a node though, meaning, you know, getting started is you need inbound liquidity for, for uh, other people's payments to flow through you, which is uh, for some, the, the hardest to get, you know, uh, some people have it easier because some people might have a footprint on social media or something and they could say, hey, I just started a new node, open up channels with me and the whole community will jump in and give them tons of inbound. Uh, but for the normal sort of person that just wants to like get going and not only that, but like the sovereign person that wants to not even tell anybody about it. Now, now we're now it's pretty challenging because unless you start a new NIM or something, and go into the Telegram group and say, hey, I'm starting a routing node. Someone open up a channel with me, yada, yada, yada. Um, that, that's, a, that's a hard sell because routing nodes um, want to open up channels with folks that will sort of reciprocate or, or had value to their own node as well. Because your routing node is only as good as the peers you're connected to at the end of the day. So there has to be some sort of incentive there. Um, so that incentive um, can come from something like Lightning Pool or liquidity ads for core lightning where you know you're you're opening up a channel to somebody but they're paying you to do so basically now that might not be for everybody uh, but that is an option one of the quickest ways i found to sort of bootstrap that inbound that initial inbound liquidity is using um, atomic swap uh services like loop or bolts and what that is, is you essentially open up a channel and then you go to the service and you say, hey, uh, so for example, if I open up a 5 million sat channel, I could say, hey, I want to move 4 million sats out of that 5 million sat channel to the other side. And what I'm essentially doing is I'm paying somebody those sats. And then they're saying, okay, pay me those 4 million sats and I will send you those 4 million back on chain. And now you have 4 million of inbound. And of course, they take a little bit of a fee for that service. But now you've, you've bootstrapped a good amount of inbound uh, for your node. And that's probably the, the, the hardest thing to do. The, 
one of the easiest ways to get inbound though is to just spend sats really because if you're spending it you're you're moving it over so if you want to uh spend sats on a bunch of gift cards or something you can do that as well um any questions so far <laughs> yeah no that that all makes a lot of sense so in terms of who you pick though for a channel yeah, okay. opening yeah. how do you how does a new person do that yeah so if i'm looking for quality peer so it's you're basically playing a game with incomplete information. It's a lot, it's a lot like poker. <laughs> so you're, uh, but thankfully a lot, a lot of information about public facing nodes and channels are sort of put together and very easy to read, uh, public databases such as amboss.space. One ML used to be the leader in that, but one ML, I don't even know who runs 1ML actually, but they haven't really updated it or done anything in a long time. So Tony who built Thunderhub and Jester, who's a really good friend of mine also are building this amboss.space um, platform where you can go and you can see, um, basically look at a node, you can see what their channels are, see what their capacities are and see what their, um, what their fee rates are like and that sort of thing. So there's multiple factors. My my biggest factor though is um, how many channels does the node I'm opening up with have and what is their average channel size? If I'm looking to open up a 5 million sat channel, I don't want to open up a 5 million sat channel with, with a node that has 500,000 sat <laughs> average size, right? Um, even with really cool things like multi-path payments, um, that's still sort of a bottleneck because not everybody uses AMP and multipath payments right now. Uh, so that is, uh, I want I want that average channel size to be near the size that I want to open, and that and uh, and generally, if they have at least twenty channels, that's that's good. Um, the age of the node also needs to sort of be taken into account, and you can go to. Um, terminal.lightning.engineering and see if they're, um, which is a lightning lab sort of ranking database using their own arbitrary metrics, but it gives you a good idea if they're online or offline a lot, because they'll have this pretty green color next to their, <laughs> next to their node name. So I would use lightning.terminal.engineering in conjunction with amboss.space to, um, sort of vet nodes that I'm, I'm looking to open up with. A lot of people think that they just want to open up nodes to the, or channels to the biggest nodes on the network and they're going to be all set. Um, but for a routing node, that's not quite the best idea. It's okay to have a few channels like that. But the issue is if you're just connecting to um, big routing nodes on the network or just big nodes in general on the network, you're essentially competing with all the other channels that are with them. So the ultimate goal of a routing node is to find paths from medium to smaller nodes that are making payments to go to services and um, you know where, where you think that uh, traffic is flowing to. So maybe you want to open up a channel with bit refill and then you want to go and maybe open up some channels to like some smaller nodes also and have a variety of connections. And uh, yeah, we're, we could go deep into theory on that, but yeah. that's... Um, yeah, no, I think which, that's a which good is high a level idea. Itself, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. But I think just to give people a flavor and just to summarize, and I think that's right. The general idea is that you want to open channels in the direction that you believe the flow is going to go. Right. So let's mm -hmm. say you believe there's a new new if you knew there's a new hot merchant in town, you know, and you believe everyone's going to be paying them because let's say they've got some really cool Bitcoin merchandise or some other thing they're selling for Bitcoin, you you as a smart routing node operator are thinking, yeah, all right, sweet. I know a lot of people want to pay this guy. So let me try and get a channel open to him because then as they want to pay to him, they're going to route it through me. And so then I'm going to collect some routing fees. And so I guess that's kind of like a high level or at least one way of thinking about that part of it. But then like you said, you still want to have other people who want to pay you through that. So you still have to think about that aspect of it. That's a great example because I think that um, as a routing node operator, being constantly aware of new merchants, new merchants and services that are just starting, it, you're you're really incentivized actually to give them inbound liquidity because you, which means open up a channel with them because you know that the flow 
um, is, you know, especially if they're a, a high level merchant or whatever, like Great American Mining, for example, just enabled Bitcoin Lightning on their store. So I'm thinking, OK, if I'm one of the first people to open up a channel with them, um, I can set my fee rate higher because there's less competition right now. But it's more competition, meaning more people open up channels to them that might drive the fee rate of forwarding payment to them down. Uh, that happened um, with the loop node because so the loop node at Lightning Labs is constantly doing these atomic swaps uh, or submarine swaps for for folks, meaning that, you know, uh, and which can sometimes be really big. So it and, and really high in demand. But a lot of people started realizing that and opening up channels with the loop node and uh, dry and then drove that fee rate pretty much into the ground. So uh, it, I, I think that that is a really cool sort of incentive for merchants, uh, because uh, if you get going, I think you'll see channels just open up to you naturally as part of the ecosystem. Excellent. And so how should people think about fee rates and setting the fees? So yeah. I guess the quick overview for people is generally in Lightning, there's the base fee component, which is like a like a flagfall, like as soon as you're routing a payment and that might be a certain level. And then there's the parts per million or the, the fee per how much you're routing. And listeners, also check out my earlier episode with Rene Picard, who's also got some mm-hmm. thoughts on this. But uh, Nate, I want to get your thoughts. How should users yeah. be thinking about their fee rates when they are setting up a light, Lightning routing node? Yeah, I mean... These days, there's a lot of talk, but I'm, I'll, I guess I'll like rewind to sort of the initial idea was um, base fee can be whatever you want it to be. Base fee meaning no, no matter what the size of payment you're forwarding, you are um, at least collecting that base fee. And then you can set a percentage on top of that that you can also um, uh, take basically. And th- at the time before selling liquidity was easier uh was easy um as it is today basically you would sort of guess right you would use these 1ml or amboss and you'd say okay so and so like there's <clears throat> you could you could see basically the the fee rate and say i i want to undercut some of this and i'll still sort of make a profit and when I say make a profit, we can actually, I'm going to get back to that. Um, or you can open up a channel and just set a default fee rate. A, a lot of the times it's really not that much, 50 or 100 parts per million, which is 0.005%, I think. Um, so it's not a lot. I think that um, if your goal is to earn fee income running a routing node, the bulk of your income is going to come from your channels to in-demand merchant style nodes the most. So I would set, you know, those would be a higher fee set than if, than, than just a, a normal sort of size node on the network, uh, because you're not really going to be earning a lot from, from that generally. That, that sometimes can change, but generally that's true. And then after that, so like say bit refill, for example, say that I have a 10 million set channel bit refill, it gets drained out all to the inbound. Well, now I have to figure out a way to get that liquidity back into that channel um, so so it can happen again and I could just keep sort of earning from that. So the challenge to that is what is the cost of what's called a rebalance, which is essentially paying yourself out of one of your channels and into um, the channel that you're looking to profit off of. And one of the big challenges is calculating the rebalance cost minus the fees that you get from the drain of that rebalance is your net profit. And it's actually fairly, really, really tight most of the time. Um, And it's generally not that much. Um, So I really don't think uh, earning fees on a node that isn't gigantic, like the Yalls node, for example, um, is very, you know, it's like, cool, I get some sats or whatever. So now you have folks like zero fee routing who realize, hey, listen, I'm not going to be making any fees uh, that, you know, by, I'm not going to be making that much from fees. So I'm going to provide a service saying that I'm going to do zero fee, zero base rate. Everyone could free flow through me. And then he's monetizing. I say he, I don't know who they are. It's a NIM. Uh, 
from basically saying, uh, by basically selling liquidity, selling channels, saying, hey, I've got this gigantic node with 500 channels. I don't charge any fees. If you want some liquidity from me, uh, email me and we'll discuss terms and I'll open up a channel with you. I think that's really interesting. I think that is the general way that earning income on Lightning is going to go um, for the nearish future. In the, in the far future, who knows what it will be, but in the nearest future, um, selling liquidity is probably uh, going to pick up uh, and and uh, the volume of, of that market in all of its imp, uh, integrations or um, types are is, is just going to explode. So I'm, I'm I really think that fees are like cool or whatever, but compared to selling a 10 million sat channel to a merchant and they're paying you seven percent APR or something, that's going to be where the where the money is for uh, for running a lightning node. I think. Yep, yep. Also, I want to get your thoughts on payment reliability, right? So for some users who maybe they are struggling to get more reliable payments back, you know, out or in to receive, what are the mm. typical causes for that? Do you believe that's because it's not they're not having big enough channels or they don't have it with the right channel participants or maybe their lightning mm-hmm. node isn't online enough? Like what are the typical uh, issues that you run into when you're helping troubleshoot for uh, uh, you know someone you're helping with? Yeah, I think the the hardest thing to wrap your head around when you're brand new and just kind of like trying to understand how how um, channels work and stuff is is the liquidity. Really, I mean, I've I've got folks through no fault of their own, right? They say, "Hey, I opened up like a couple channels, and I'm trying to pay." X and it's not working, or I open up a couple channels and I'm trying to receive a payment and it's not working. And then, um, you know, that could be frustrating at the start because you don't have that uh, foundational understanding of that. Oh yeah, you need inbound liquidity to do that. Oh, well, how do I do that? It's, it is a big headache and it is a little bit of a learning curve. Absolutely. And I hope in the future, this sort of thing will be more automated. Uh, So it's really uh, a lot of folks that get frustrated because they open up channels and when I say channel, maybe two or three, and then they they're frustrated because their payment isn't going through. Um, and obviously the solution to that is to choose who you're opening up your channels with very deliberately. Uh, meaning kind of what we went over before, uh, when you're initially getting started, you should, you should open up channels to, to bigger nodes on the network. It doesn't have to be the biggest nodes on the network. There's a lot of big nodes on the network now. Um, and, and sort of go from there. So yeah, if your payment's failing, we need to, we can troubleshoot that by figuring out, you know, where it's, who you're connected to, who they're connected to. It might not be a good peer to begin with. Or um, if it's the other way and they're trying to receive, we need to get them, figure out how to help them get inbound liquidity uh, through through the methods that we were talking about um, earlier. So that's, that's that, that could be pretty frustrating for people. Yeah, and so I guess that's the con- the concern or the question from a payments reliability point of view. How easy would you say it is to earn sats? Like, if you're trying to actually run a profitable routing node, do you believe that's like that a lot of people are running a profitable routing node, or do you think maybe once all costs are considered, or let's say on chain yeah. open and close fees, swap fees, rebalancing, once you can- account for all of this, do you think there are a lot of profitable routing node operators, or do you think right now it's still sort of in a you're only going to make a a small amount yeah i I think from fees for 99 percent of people it's going to be break even at best when you factor in all of that um like i said earlier i think that the the idea of selling channels is probably going to be the way to go in the future there are um you know, like I said, those services and some people even taking it into their own hands, proving that they have a really, really, really good node and proving that they have enough value that they think that others are willing to pay them to open up a channel with them, which is absolutely um, probably true. Um, that's that's what makes running a routing node exciting. You get, you get it, you know, you get that reputation up and then you're like, yeah, I'm here to like, you know, help the network and, and you get value for that. Uh, and, and that's just going to keep growing. I think that, um, 
we don't have to go too deep into it, but I'm pretty sure this is just me sort of speculating that the Taro network or whatever that Lightning Labs is building is going to be uh, uh, plugged into their Lightning Pool liquidity marketplace in some way. So even though your node might not be dealing with whatever tokens or whatever are built on that, you could still sell channels. And I, I hope the volume picks up um, on on pool thanks uh, because of uh, Taro. I think that'd be really great. Yeah, that's interesting as well. So maybe the high level summary of some of that insight is that maybe historically when, you know, in earlier years, let's say 2018, 2019, people were thinking about this idea more in terms of the routing fee income mm -hmm. where maybe the more relevant, and that was arguably the way people were thinking about in terms of lightning network reference rate, right? The, the research by Nick Bartio. But actually, I think what might be more where the money is at is the market for opening a channel to each other, right? So that mm -hmm. idea of, hey, I'm going to sell you this channel, right? So I know in the early days, BitRefill had their Thor channels and nowadays there's Lightning Lab Pool, there's, you know, liquidity ads, there's, you know, there's this zero fee routing guy, there's this kind of model where you're selling a channel up front. And I know even with Voltage, you've got uh, a flow, right? And that, that uh, I believe that's working using Lightning Labs Pool, right? So could you tell us a little yeah. bit about how that part of it works? Yeah, flow flow is really really cool. Um, so when pool came out about a year and a half ago now, um, they also had this idea of what they called sidecar channels or sidecar tickets. And all a sidecar ticket is is essentially a order for liquidity from Lightning Pool from the Lightning Pool marketplace that somebody else uh, can like print out saying, hey, I want 5 million sats and I'm willing to pay 5,000 sats for this. <clears throat> and then a little ticket comes out, which is just a string of letters and numbers. And then you could redeem that ticket as if you put in the order yourself. So one of the big headaches with pool is you have to have um, a pool account, they call it, which is essentially a registered UTXO with Lightning Labs to sort of prove that you have funds. And that's where you sort of pay fees uh, in and out of pool. But with sidecar channels, you don't need a pool account. So at Voltage, we run, you know, a pool account using the Voltage sats, and we essentially have a little user interface. And Flow is cool because anyone using LND is welcome to go to Voltage.cloud, go to Flow, no KYC or anything, and make your own sidecar ticket if you'd like, and redeem it on your own node. You don't need to be running a Voltage node, um, but you can say, hey, I want I want a four million sat channel. I want to pay ten thousand sats. I want it for 2016 blocks and um, and whatever. And you hit cre create and, you know, in the background, we generate a sidecar ticket that you can go redeem. You could give to your friend. Um, and essentially that puts in an order into the Lightning Pool marketplace um, as if you were running pool sort of yourself. Uh, so that's been really popular. Um, there, are, because um, voltage nodes are sort of Tor only, there's been a little bit of hiccups. Because Tor has um, uh, Tor can sometimes like slow down, and the way that Lightning Pool uh, matches um, has, it has there's a timer for the match before the total peer connection channel open thing can happen. So if Tor just kind of times out on that, it doesn't fully complete. Um, but thankfully, we've been uh, working really hard with the team at Lightning Labs to help uh, alleviate a lot of that. And the newest pool version helped out a lot with matching with um, our sidecar tickets. And I think uh, according to our metrics, uh, about 30-ish percent of the bid side of the pool order book, meaning those looking to buy liquidity, is is done through flow sidecar tickets right now, which is really cool. Oh, well, that's a, that's a fair amount. Yeah, so I guess yeah. it is just early days of lightning. And I know uh, Voltage is used both for, let's say, the you know people who want to run their Lightning node like as an individual, but also companies who want to run like a, a VPS level routing mm -hmm. node, they, they might use you know Voltage for that. So that's um, interesting to see where where things are going with all of this. Um, also, I wanted to get your thoughts on backing up a Lightning node. So how is mm. this done currently? What are the best practices around this? Yeah, so there's there's two pieces of information to do a full recovery. And so this is strictly for LND. 
Uh, that's the only one I really feel comfortable <laughs> giving advice about. But um, so when you start up an L&D Lightning node, you're provided what's called a cipher seed phrase. And the seed phrase that you're given is, is, is sort of a unique one, though. You cannot use this on a Blockstream Green wallet or a Samurai wallet to recover. It is strictly an L&D cipher seed phrase. So you write down these seed phrase, just a bunch of words, like the kind you're used to. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> and, then, um, and then off you go, right? Now, every time that something happens to one of your channels, um, behind the scenes, uh, your signature and your peer signature, because uh, a channel is just a two of two multi-sig, is um, signing an on-chain transaction. It's not broadcasting, but just signing it, updating the channel state. Meaning, you know, if, if I pay you 500000 we both sign the new update channel state. And this is important because if we close the channel or uh, worst case scenario, we force close the channel, um, these are broadcasted and we all get our money back. Uh, so I guess to go off on a side note there, um, for security purposes, this is another really important reason why you want to be online all the time um, because there is the possibility that if you go offline, your peer could broadcast to the network that they own more sats than they actually do in a fair world. And they could say, uh, you know, before you paid them a million or before they paid you a million, they could broadcast a, a channel state transaction that was said that they add what they actually did it. And now you're out of money because you're not online to sort of, uh, contest uh the 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 agreement the contract um so lighting labs has uh, watchtowers which is essentially you can have a the node of a friend or you can run a secondary node that can watch yours and keep uh the channel states uh correct and the cool thing about watchtowers is uh any nefarious actor doesn't know if there's a watchtower watching or not. So now there's, uh, and that's important because the, uh, the punishment for, uh, <laughs> the justice transaction, they don't call it that anymore. I forget what they call it now. Um, but I, I still like justice transaction is basically if you get caught cheating and it's really obvious that you're cheating, that's an old channel state because you know, time, time stamps and everything, uh, the person being cheated, gets the whole balance. Uh, so people that are want to try to use that sort of cheat are very, very disincentivized from doing so, especially because watchtowers are so easy to run. And there's a bunch of public watchtowers you could connect your node to, to watch your node if, if you go offline nowadays. All right. So let's talk about recovery now. So say I'm running a Raspberry Pi. It broke. Crap. Uh, so I've got my Cypher Seeds here. I put, uh, so what you would do at that point is you would start a new LND node somewhere. It could be on voltage. It doesn't matter where you, you start a new LND node and these recover from seed. Great. You boom, 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 recover from seeds. <clears throat> but your the, the, the node that you're now on doesn't have the, um, the funds that are in your offline channels. You, you might have access to the on-chain component of your lightning node, but you don't have your channel. So what do you do there? Well, there's a secondary file, which is very, very small called the channel backup file or the static channel backup, the SCB. And this is what you use. This is what is constantly being updated also when uh, your node um, opens or closes channels. It, it records a history of these things and it records a, the, trans, the force close uh, pre-signed uh, transaction. So if you upload that also, it triggers all of those channels to force close and it could some take, sometimes take a few days, but eventually those funds will be in the on-chain component of your lightning wallet. Essentially, you know, minus fees on chain, essentially you get all your money back at that point. And a lot of people that I have talked to, this has happened to, they then say, cool, I got all my sats back in my on chain. I'm going to start opening up channels again. And I highly recommend that after, if this ever happens, you, and you, you actually use your static channel backup and you have everything, get those funds off of that node as soon as possible, put it somewhere safe and you can put it into a cold storage or something if it's a lot. 
and then just start a brand new lightning node with a whole new uh, cipher phrase and everything. Just start fresh. Um, just I can't really articulate why that's important, but I just feel like if you're gonna like start from fresh anyway, just just start fresh, um, and, and you should be all good. So the static channel backup is something that is constantly put in your LND directory. Um, you can download it also from Thunderhub if you're using Thunderhub. If you're using Balance of Satoshi's, uh, there's a Telegram bot that'll auto download your uh, channel backup for you into Telegram, which is really cool. And if somebody finds your static channel backup, they can't do anything with it without your uh, Cypher seed phrase. So don't worry about saving that on your computer or anything, because I'm assuming that your seed words are not on your computer along with it. Uh, so that shouldn't be an issue. And there's a few other things. I think um, Amboss is actually doing a... Uh, a, a way for them to pull the static channel back up for you also. So you don't have to constantly like, oh, I got to go download my thing. It should be automatic, hopefully. Uh, Voltage does something similar also. Gotcha, because I mean, I'm sure people are thinking, hey, I can set up like a cron job to automate the saving sure. of that or pushing that somewhere else. But I mean, for people who, who don't want it, who aren't going to that level, um, <clears throat> right. Uh, and so also... Just any thoughts around swap providers? So I know you mentioned earlier, you know, Bolts as an example. Do you have any thoughts mm -hmm. on um, the use of swap providers? Should uh, Lightning Node, Routing Node Runner be look using them? Um, should you be paying for this kind of swapping in and out service? Yeah, so there's a couple of um, scenarios where you would want to use it. And the First scenario is you are just starting a node and you really want to get that inbound liquidity fast. And the swap um, like the loop or bolts is, you know, it, it costs some money to get going, but the it gets you going faster for that inbound capacity. Now, a really cool strategy that I like, because I bootstrap several routing nodes at this point, is I take the initial capital that I'm looking to put into my uh, my node and I take a good chunk of that and I open up a big channel to maybe the async node or something, uh, or just like a big, a big node. And then, so say for example, I have 50 million sats. I'll, I'm going to open up a 40 million sat channel with async and then I'm going to loop out like 35 million of it, right? So now I got a huge chunk of inbound on that channel. Um, I did pay for it. You know, I probably paid over 100,000 sats to do that loop out. Um, but I've got 35 million stats of inbound now. Now I could take the, that chunk that I got back on chain. Now I can open up my five or four million sat channels uh, going down. And you can only do that when you're first starting a node, though. You can't you know, open up five million channels and then say, oh, crap, I should have done this. Uh, so I think that's a really cool like first step for getting a ton of inbound. And then after you do that, you can you could try doing the circular rebalance where you, you know, you're just trying to sort of pay into that big channel that you have with the inbound to sort of get everything balanced, assuming the fee rates are, are good uh, for doing that. So that, that's a huge, uh, I think that's a really cool sort of hack to, to bootstrap. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so then the other aspect, I'm curious, how big are the payments that you can easily route through the lightning network today? Like I think yeah. the, we see varying reports on social media and even with people's own nodes, they might be easily able to do small payments, but then once you start trying to do larger payments, it becomes less reliable. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that today and how that could be improved or what that means yeah. for the state of Lightning in terms of payment reliability? So, yeah, so the, the more you're looking to pay, the less of the network you can access um just by design that makes sense um so if i'm looking to pay two million sets i essentially can just minus out all of the channels out there that are less than two million and then and then work from there uh, again we're not talking about amp or anything which is really cool like amp will let me pay out two million sats using three different uh sort of payment paths to sort of piece it together which is actually i i think amazing and i think we're going to see more of that going forward so hopefully that'll alleviate some of the pressure in the future and um and the other thing is obviously as uh the fiat exchange rate um increases <clears throat> next to bitcoin the 
the amount of value that a channel can process also increases, right? When I first started, we were sub 10,000. So like a 10 million sad channel is like whatever, but now a 10 million sad channel is, you know, 4,000 US dollars. So that's, that's pretty darn good, right? That's, uh, um, pretty good. (laughs) So it's like a TV, right? So, uh, so I guess it's just like a time thing, but also as time goes on, the ability to open up bigger channels for most people also decreases. So, um, the sort of routing nodes now that were around enough to be able to afford, uh, at the time was a a $1,000, which was 10 million sat channels. Um, that might be a premium in the future for routing, uh, so uh, I guess it kind of is what it is at that point. It's supposed to, it's a double edged sword number go up on this. Um, uh, I, I hope that amp and a few other of these tools that allow you to make bigger payments through multiple, you know, payment, uh, out, out flows, uh, really takes off though. Cause I think that'll take away a lot of that pressure. Yeah. And I'm also curious to get your thoughts around, what do you think the average percent of the fee is going to be taken for payments, right? So as an example, if we're comparing uh, Lightning with Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, where let's say the merchant in the background is actually paying 3 4 maybe even 5% for that payment, uh, you uh, know, like um, whereas let's say today in the Lightning Network, what kind of numbers are we seeing people are paying? Like, is it kind of in that half a percent range, 0.4%? Do you think it's roughly going to mm. be in that range? Or do you have any thoughts where uh, where that currently is and where you, if you have any speculation, where you think it might be going? Yeah, I kind of see what you're saying. So um, if I'm paying for a gift card, I'm using Thunderhub to, to, so Bid Refill gives me a invoice. I take that invoice, I paste it in Thunderhub. Thunderhub's selling me, Okay, what is the max amount of fee that you're willing to pay to to send this transaction? And so you kind of have to pick. Oh, I'm willing to pay 50 sats, or I'm willing to pay 100 sats. It might not be that much, but you're just telling them, you know, as as it's looking for a path to that final destination, it's it's calculating the routing fees along the way and saying, oh, this doesn't meet the criteria. We'll try this path. That doesn't meet the criteria. You know, we'll try this path. Um, so I don't really think of it as sort of percentage. I I can imagine that the high percentage routes will be brought down in time because routing nodes will catch on to that and want to open up channels with that to try to get a piece of that action, which will drive it back down. Um, so I can't really give a hard number on that. I don't, I mean, obviously buying something from BitRefill is going to cost more of a routing fee than me just paying Joe down the street uh, that doesn't have a big footprint in, you know, on the network. Uh, just, just, that's just the nature of the beast though. I think that the free market on that will drive fees down. I think that'd be the natural course. Some people might disagree with me. I might not be, uh, playing it through all the way, but I would think that would be the way it goes. So hopefully it drives fees down. And, um, because I think there's a good chance that just routing fees in general will just be not, not the focus for, earning on on lightning in the future as well yeah that's interesting because the routing node operators still if they're running it professionally they need to make money somehow um Mm -hmm. but as if you're saying that they're not going to make their money on that they need to make their money in some other way whether that's the selling of the channel or some other means then yeah it it, i guess it's still a bit of an open question where does it settle down Uh, because of course, like generally speaking in the free market, of course, yeah, the things the prices are coming down. But in this case, there is a bit of an opportunity cost, right? Because you are putting your sats into a lightning channel. There is some risk with that. It's not just risk free. And sure. right routing node operators and lightning service providers and so on, people have to get compensated. So uh, yeah, I guess it's an interesting question to see where that goes because, you know, in the early days of lightning, it might be very like hobbyist and everyone's kind of just personally subsidizing it anyway because you know they just love it and they just want to do it Mm -hmm. i'm just curious where it goes as the industry professionalizes as it matures as people actually have to start getting profit for it or you know or as you're saying maybe the profit is going to be there but it's going to come in a different way yeah 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. And that's what makes kind of everything so exciting, though. You know, it's only been a few years and things change all the time and there's always something else to learn. And there's all these cool open source apps that help you monitor your node like LND Mon and, and LN Bits is, uh, you know, Ben Arc LN Bits is just awesome. Um, and there's just all these cool things. And it's, just, it's, it's kind of overwhelming, but um, it's a fun hobby. And the thing is, if, if anyone is sort of thinking about running a lightning node, I recommend just diving in, join the telegram groups. The PlebNet groups are still super active and they're super helpful and, and just give it a shot. You know, just, just you, you'll learn a lot. And I, I, I think that it's totally worth it, whether it's Umbral or Raspy Blitz or Raspberry Bolt. I have a soft spot in my heart for Raspberry Bolt. Raspberry Bolt and Staticus taught me Linux basically. And I'll, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. So I, I think that folks that, you know, if you have like a technical sort of aptitude and you want to like learn Linux, learning it with Bitcoin is a lot of fun too. So I recommend just diving in and, and don't worry about being overwhelmed or anything. Just take it one step at a time and, and you'll learn what you need to learn. Fantastic. Well, I think that's probably a, a great spot to finish up. So Nate, before we let you go, where can people find you online and where can they find Voltage online? Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, it was, it was a great time. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm at Beef or Bacon one on Twitter. Please follow me. Please DM me. Let me know if you need anything. Uh, we do have also a Voltage community, voltage.cloud slash Discord to join our Discord group. Uh, that's for anyone running lightning. We have tons of channels talking about things all the time. And sometimes, uh, Zebedee has the, um, has a discord bot where you can sling sats at people in the discord group. So we do that sometimes it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then voltage.cloud, uh, we have a seven day free trial on testnet. If you want to play around with the dashboard and, uh, check it out, um, please do. We've got a lot of cool things coming, so stay tuned for everything. And thanks again, Stefan. Thanks, Nate. Bye.